Dylan Gabriel will be Oregon's quarterback in 2024. Is the Oklahoma transfer good enough to get the Ducks to the playoff? Yeah, I think so. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Send me all of your questions about Oregon's quarterback, anything that you want to know. We've got plenty to answer here on the show. And just remember, though this is not the end of the season that we were hoping for as Duck fans, you could have watched Kadarius Toney line up offsides and ruin the coolest play in NFL history. So it could be worse. Let's talk about Dylan Gabriel here. So Dylan Gabriel comes over from Oklahoma where he had a productive season. And I think fundamentally the question that, you know, I've been asking myself and, you know, I'm now going to answer here on the la- over the last couple of days is with Dylan Gabriel, healthy and at quarterback for the Ducks next year, can Oregon make the newly expanded, though I don't like it, 12 team college football playoff? To me, that answer is yes. So when you look at Oregon's schedule right now, they have 13 games on it. I, I have not seen that before. I don't know why. I know it's because there's a Hawaii matchup in there. I don't know. I I, like, I, I I really don't know. But as of now, this schedule for the Ducks next year goes Hawaii, Idaho, Boise State, Oregon State. That's assuming they finalize the swapping of the Boise State, Texas Tech, and Civil War and everything like that. Then at UCLA, Michigan State at home. I'm just going to leave that one there. Uh, it deserves a little bit of an extra pause. Ohio State at Purdue, Illinois at Michigan, Maryland at Wisconsin, and then Washington. So if Oregon sticks to playing 13 games next year, I think if they win 11 of them, as they did this season, they're into the playoff. Whether they're competing for a Big Ten championship or not, I think that 11-2 and two and not going to the Big Ten title game, frankly, probably puts Oregon into a 12-team college football playoff. So then you come back and ask yourself, well, is Dylan Gabriel good enough to do that? Well, yeah, clearly he is. He led Oklahoma to a 10-2 and season this year. And was he my number one target coming out of the portal? No. Would he have been inside my top three or four? I didn't make one. But yes, he would have been one of the top three options in the transfer portal. I like Riley Leonard at Duke as well. But Yeah, Dylan Gabriel is one of the top options for a reason. Other schools were after him for a reason. Oklahoma went 10-2 and this year. And so you have to ask yourself, is this year's Oklahoma team better, as good, or not as good as this year's Oregon team? Or more accurately, or more appropriately, I'd say, the team that Oregon will field next year. That's the unknown commodity. But playing in a Big 12 that was not particularly good, But I I think Oklahoma was not particularly great. I think they were good, but not great. Playing in the Big 12 this year, Dylan Gabriel just won 10 games in a Power 5 conference. And I think that Oregon, as a team, is capable of being better, and they were this year, than Oklahoma. And so if you put Dylan Gabriel onto an Oregon team that is better going up against a tougher schedule, yeah, I think Oregon could win. 10 or 11 games next year, which is probably what you need. 10 would probably be the minimum to be in consideration. I I think you have to beat at least one of Washington, Ohio State, Michigan in order to be in that in that discussion. Like if Oregon were to go 10 and three and have a chance at the playoff, your losses would have to be like you, you would need a win against Michigan, Ohio State or Washington, two of which are at home. So I feel like Oregon will be able uh, to get one of those. We'll see how the offseason goes. But I think that Dylan Gabriel is good. I do not think that Dylan Gabriel is going to come in and take a massive leap forward in production because I think he had a good team around him at, at Oklahoma. I think he'll have a better one at Oregon. But offensively, I don't know that there's going to be as big of a gap. I think that Oregon's defense is going to be a little bit better. I think their offensive coordinators are 
probably about a wash, probably a lean towards Will Stein, but Jeff Levy just got the Mississippi State head coaching job for a reason. He did a really, really good job. And I think that they have good weapons at Oklahoma. And I don't know how their offensive line play was, but it probably wasn't quite as good as Oregon's. But if Dylan Gabriel comes in and Oregon is able to do enough to just keep him as the same football player that he was this past season, that is enough production from the quarterback position if everything else works out the way that it should, offseason and then translating it to on the field, to where Oregon should win at least 10, if not 11 games next year, playing a 13-game regular season. So that's just what I'm looking at. Is I, I don't look at Gabriel and say, oh, let's, you know, how can we get him to put up a Bo Nix type season? You not you, you can't have that expectation in your head. That's an anomaly. Oregon's had a lot of transfer quarterbacks, but there has there have been varying results, much like high school quarterbacks, by the way. Dakota Prukop didn't work. Vernon Adams did work. Jeremiah Masoli was a junior college transfer. That one worked. Anthony Brown didn't work quite as well. The Oregon won 10 games. We all agree it left a little something to be desired. So you're going to have hits and misses, whether you're recruiting kids from the high school ranks at any position or bringing them in from the transfer portal. And I think that Oregon can do enough to just keep Dylan Gabriel as the same guy he was this year, which, by the way, was a very productive quarterback, not Heisman level. I don't think he was ever inching towards that particular discussion, even when Oklahoma was undefeated. But he completed almost 70% of his passes. That's an outstanding clip. He went for over 3,500 yards, 30 touchdowns, six picks. He ran for 12 touchdowns and almost 400 yards on the ground. If he does all of that, and I don't know that Will Stein's going to run him quite as much, which I am okay with. If you tell me that Dylan Gabriel puts up similar numbers, and let's let's just say hypothetically, it's 68% completion, 3,700 yards, 34 touchdowns, five or fewer interceptions, and he has you know some production with his legs as well, my sense is Oregon's probably in the college football playoff. Probably. Not guaranteed, because Oregon wasn't there this year, of course, with a Heisman finalist. However, that's in the four-team era. And in the 12-team era, the threshold is not as high to get there, though it is still not a cakewalk. It's not a given that Oregon will be into the playoff. They have to win at least one maybe two of those big games against Michigan, Ohio State, and Washington. But I think if Dylan Gabriel is able to produce at the level he did this year, then yeah, that is good enough quarterback play as long as the rest of the team plays as they're capable of and you know, landing in the staff, which they've done a great job with talent acquisition. If they are able to put together a similar caliber of team around Dylan Gabriel, yeah, I think that is good enough. But let me know what you think in the comments on YouTube or on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked On Ducks. Those be the handles over there. I, I do, just to put a bow on this, I've never seen Oregon play a 13-game regular season before. Hawaii did it this year. I believe it's so that they can have an extra game where someone pays them money because they have so much extra travel because they're flying from you know Hawaii. <laughs> to play Mountain West football and Big West for all their other sports. It's not like there's a short flight. That's the best conference combination you could have uh, to play competitively. But I, I, I find it curious to say the least. But if Oregon's going to go forward with four non-conference games, then okay. I, I guess that is fine. You know, one of those games is Idaho, so starters shouldn't play a whole lot in that football game regardless. We'll just kind of see. I, I still just have this sneaky suspicion in the back of my mind that either the Hawaii or the Idaho game get bought out. And Oregon says, here's a check for the game. We're just going to play 12. But we'll see. We'll see. I've I, I've been wrong on that sort of stuff before. But bringing in Dylan Gabriel, a left-handed quarterback, poses an interesting question. I have one for you first, which is why haven't you gone to eBay Motors yet? If you have, you know why it's great. Because passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, 
eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, that's a good combination there. Like Bo Nix to Troy Franklin, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, got my second, second, second segment sip down. That alliteration was almost too much for me today, but alas, it was not. Number of ways to get into the mailbag. YouTube comments, Twitter, those are great ways to reach me. If you want priority mailbag access, though, you can go join the Locked On Ducks subtext community. Link in the description below, wherever you listen to or watch this show. Free 14-day trial, and it's just $5 a month. You get all sorts of perks. You can talk with me one-on-one more easily. Get my immediate thoughts to breaking news and stay up to date with everything regarding Oregon, not just football, but basketball as well. Certainly, though, not a requirement. Show is still free and available wherever you're listening to or watching it right now. This question from the subtext community. You get priority mailbag over there. I'm a man of my word. Hey, Spence, here's a question for the pod. With Dylan Gabriel being a lefty, which thanks to you, I now know, thanks to you, LOL. I like the double thanks to me. Double thanking me. I'm always here for it. Uh, Assuming for the most part, everyone returns on the offensive line with the exceptions of players graduating. Do you imagine players swapping their places on the line, i.e. Josh Connerly moving from left tackle to right tackle, a Johnny Cornelius from right to left, et cetera, or would it be better to have the linemen stay where they are regardless of who is throwing the ball? This is a fantastic question because the most important offensive line positions are center and left tackle because traditionally quarterbacks are right-handed and protecting his blind side is the most important element aside from the guy who makes the calls and actually you know gets the quarterback the ball. I do not think the move is to reshuffle the offensive line because – Unless you have a massive talent gap from one tackle position to the other, and guys are capable of moving, but unless there's a huge gap or for some reason you really just want to have one guy doing blindside protection, I don't see a reason to move if Cornelius does come back. He could go to the NFL, but Connerly, of course, cannot. I don't see a reason to move Cornelius and Connerly from one side to the other. So Panay Sewell plays for the Lions, and he is just a bona fide stud, which we all knew he was going to be. And he has proven to be that all-pro caliber guy. He has played both left and right tackle. I think he mostly plays right tackle for the Lions, but they move him around a little bit. Guys who can do that are, are very rare. <laughs> like, very, very rare. It is not easy to have positional versatility and be able to play at such a high level. It's why Ryan Walk was such an impressive player for Oregon. He could play right guard. He could play left guard. He could play center. I think he even took some snaps at tackle. Like that is a really difficult thing to do, you know, especially being able to play both outside and inside. I think he was mostly on the interior if memory serves, but I think that for Cornelius, he was great this year at right tackle. Connerly was good at left tackle. I don't think you move those guys. Because unless you feel that, you know, Connerly is just so much better than Cornelius, which I don't get the sense at all. I think if anything, Cornelius had a better season than Connerly in some respects. Then you just keep your tackles where they're at, because then the the feel, the assignments, the the, the a, everything just stays the same for him. And I don't think you need to make that shift when you have that high level guy. But a great, great, great question there. Here's another one. So this two two questions on this particular matter. I will read them as they uh, came into me. Mailbag, locked on ducks. This was again from subtext. Oregon has incoming five-star Westland kicker Gage, Gage Hurick. He rates as a two-star in 24-7 sports. So I don't know where you saw five-star, but that's what 24-7 sports has him as right now. Given the importance of this position, wouldn't it be wise for Oregon to look for a college senior kicker in the transfer portal? Now, Another question came in as well from the camel, which is a heck of a name, but that's what he has chosen. And so we go with it. 
Hey, Spencer, every day are here. Appreciate you. Keep up the great work. It's much appreciated. What what are the odds the Ducks can bolster the kicking game in the transfer portal? I don't think there's much, if any, talk about special teams improvement this way, at least what I've heard. Thanks. So this particular conversation is a tricky one because Oregon, coming into the year, I had no worries whatsoever about kicking. You had Camden Lewis, who last year, I believe, was second team all Pac-12 who is tremendously experienced. He was a reliable kicker last year. That is an objective fact. It doesn't feel that way right now, but that is a reality. And so Camden Lewis is a senior. I believe he is out of eligibility. Let me do math in my head. He was a freshman in 2019, and COVID just makes this stuff difficult. I'll be so excited when we don't have to factor that in, and seniors will just be you know, seniors. But – Camden Lewis was a freshman in 2019. 2020 would have been year two. 2021, 2022, 2023. So Lewis's career, he is the, I believe, leading scorer in Oregon history, by the way, is in fact done. There is Grant Metters on the roster, who is a freshman currently from Bakersfield. You also have Andrew Boyle on the roster, but I don't expect him to necessarily be there next year. He was kind of in and out, and he hasn't really done uh, place kicking. He was a, a kickoff specialist kind of guy. And they have the kid coming in from Westland. I think given the youth and inexperience, it is 100% possible, dare I say, a good idea for Oregon to find a reliable field goal kicker. Now, Camden Lewis, in his defense, was absolute nails in the Pac-12 championship game. Every kickoff was a touchback, none were out of bounds, and he made his only field goal and he made all of his extra points. He He was literally perfect. He could not have had a better game. He could have had a better season, though. And that was costing Oregon in certain games. It was allowing opponents to stay in it. And most notably, if he makes a 42-yarder straight away with good conditions in Seattle, Oregon at least gets to go to overtime. No guarantee they win, but the offense did its job, moving the ball down the field, set him up. You got to be able to make that kick. And he could not. Now, he did win the Texas Tech game because if he misses that, I think a 31-yarder, then Oregon loses. But that's the way kicking goes sometimes. But can Oregon upgrade at that position? 100%. I don't know what sorts of options are out there with regards to place kickers in the transfer portal. But given just the sheer volume of kids that are moving around in college football at the FBS and FCS levels, I don't see how there couldn't be an option out there. Now. I tend to trust the coaching staff when it comes to personnel decisions. And, you know, I wrote about this over at 750thegame.com just as, as an example if you want to go check it out. But, you know, Ty Thompson is a guy who, when we saw him throughout the year, we were asking ourselves, hey, is this guy just good enough to be the starter next year? Legitimate question. The staff has decided, no, he is not. We can find somebody better. They see a lot more of Ty Thompson than we do. And they see these kickers every day. Joe Lorig, the special teams coach, had a great reputation when he came over from Penn State. And by the way, I think has done a good job. Last year's special teams were not good, aside from Camden Lewis. This year's special teams dramatically improved. I thought kickoff coverage was way better. I thought punt coverage was really good. Punt yardage was exceptional. I mean, Ross James and Luke Dunn had awesome seasons. And they use Dunn periodically in certain situations. Ross James was fantastic. I, I actually want to double check that he's back next year because Oregon's defensive improvement, I don't think you can undersell the importance of having a punter. Yeah, James was a redshirt sophomore. Sign me up for two more years of that guy. I, I mean, he was bombing balls down the field, just hitting mammoth shots into the air. And that helps the defense tremendously. So I think the growth for Lorig there was – was playing out on the field. I think the return game was better, though still not as good as we've seen it at Oregon through the years. I thought Tez Johnson did a good job. I never felt that he was a Mikhail Wright, Charles Nelson, or DeAnthony Thomas back there. So I think that there was progress in that sense, and that should give you confidence that, okay, the special teams coach is going to know what he's doing. He appears to know what he's doing. And if they feel that, you know, maybe Metters will be uh, a good enough kicker next year or the freshman coming in from West Lynn, Gage Urich, uh, if, if they feel that he or Gage Hurick, I think is how you pronounce his name. If they feel that he's good enough, 
then I trust the staff. And it's it, it's they 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 cannot have predicted what happened to Camden Lewis this year. Like there was no reason, especially after the Texas Tech game, to sense that it was a problem, and it just became a problem. You can't. I, I don't think you can do anything about that. All the evidence was the kicking game is fine, and then it and then it wasn't, and 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 then it wasn't. But Oregon was able to overcome that this year. If there are kickers in the portal, which I have to assume there are at least a couple, yeah, I, I would think Oregon would at the very least be poking around. They're poking around with some other names in the transfer portal, though, which you should be aware of. You should also be aware of Prize Picks, though, because that's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North. America, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. That's all. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and you watch the winnings roll in. Want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill or comedian Andrew Schultz? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy. So your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. We know how frustrating that is in fantasy football. And for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half, does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So go check them out at prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use that code locked on college for a first deposit match up to 100 Pricepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Price picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Okay, let's keep it rolling here. Might have spit on my own mic a little bit. All right, back into the mailbag we go. This from Monica. Hi, Spencer. For this 70 year old lady, can you tell me what you think about Dan Lanning's growth as a coach? By the way, the Ducks had a great season. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Just so sorry the loss they lost the Washington game. Games, plural, unfortunately. Nothing to be ashamed of. Just on the day. Thanks. I listen to your podcast every day. Thank you very much, Monica. I appreciate that. I wonder how many other 70-year-old women listen to this show. I don't know. Monica could be the only one, or it could be a huge swath of my demographic that I am oblivious to. But... I appreciate all of you, no matter who you are or where you are or why you choose to listen to the show. So I think this is something that can be expanded upon. But my two minute thoughts on it, on on landing so far go like this. He's clearly hungry to be a great coach. He has all the tools and resources at Oregon to do that. He has won 21 games in the last two years, has never lost to an unranked team. And yeah, he's 0-3 against Washington. They have a really good coach too with some really great players. And they've got a great offensive coordinator. And guess what? Ryan Day is a really good coach. And he's lost three in a row to Michigan. It doesn't sit right when you lose those rivalry games, especially when as Oregon and Michigan have, you've become accustomed to winning in that particular rivalry. But guess what? I think Lanning is a guy that rolls out of bed thinking about how he can get better as a coach, how he can make his team better, how he can make his roster better. And from year one to year two, we saw dramatic growth, allowing 10 points per game fewer defensively, which was personnel driven and scheme driven. We saw an offense that got even better than last year. And I felt was better than last year, even with a bunch of turnover along the offensive line. I think when you look at all the elements that you want as a head coach, this is the first time he's ever been a head coach. He's never done it before. And last year, I think there were some growing pains. The Washington, the Oregon State games, those were growing pains. This year's losses to Washington were not like last year's. Last year, it felt like Oregon was just unable to make an adjustment in the second half in both the Washington and Oregon State games. I thought the second half adjustments this year defensively were outstanding. And I felt that, you know, unfortunately, aside from the Pac-12 championship game, Oregon came ready to play every week. I felt their game plans were good. I felt the team played hard, and they didn't put their best foot forward in the Pac-12 championship game. But the old saying goes, progress is not linear. Doesn't look like it does on, you know, a basic supply and demand graph. It is two steps forward, one step back. And I think that's what Oregon did this year. 
Last season, they got off to the bad start against Georgia. They won eight in a row, and then they had a couple of hiccups down the stretch. And, and for all the talk, you know, Washington's our, our big rival. So, of course, those games are going to get more attention. Dan Lanning is 2-0 and against Kyle Whittingham. <laughs> that guy is widely regarded over the last two seasons as the best coach in the Pac-12. Now, Kalen DeBoer has probably got that title for this season, but Whittingham is an outstanding football coach, and Lanning beat him two seasons in a row. This is not a guy who is incapable of coaching or incapable of winning big games. Josh Pate makes this point a lot. There's a difference between can't and haven't. Dan Lanning hasn't beat Kalen DeBoer in Washington. He is capable of doing so. He's got three losses by three points. DeBoer has been a head coach for over 115 games in his career, around 115 games. Dan Lanning's done it for 26. So, yeah, DeBoer's been better in those particular matchups. Lanning will improve. I think he has improved, and I think there are going to be other elements where we look back and go, boy, this used to be an issue, but it wasn't. I see so many tangible areas of growth, and the recruiting has been great, and I think the culture is great, and you know his, his public messaging and everything he says, the way he talks about his, his players – I think he's really embracing the roles being the head coach of the program, and I am I, I am stoked that he is our head coach going forward. Can he get better? Yep. But he can really only get better one way. Like the only thing he's got left to do, beat Washington. Beat Washington. We'll see how the Michigan-Ohio State games go next year. Those will be big-time matchups. So closing with this one, Mike. Hey, Spencer. With the Ducks extending an offer to defensive lineman Walter Nolan from Texas A&M, former number one overall recruit, if he commits, how much of a benefit do you think it will be for the younger guys coming in and that got some playing time this year? Also, this is funny. One thing I'd like to add, my last name is Nix, spelled N-I-X. My older brother's legal name is Bo Nix. When Bo announced his transfer to Oregon, I knew it would be nothing but good things. Super excited we get to watch him play for the Ducks one last time. Go Ducks. I agree with you. I'm excited to watch Bo Nix play for Oregon football. One more time. Uh, that's a fantastic tidbit. I'm glad you shared that. On the Walter Nolan question, though, I think we saw the benefit of having multiple high-level NFL caliber defensive linemen when Jordan Birch came in to supplement Brandon Dorless this year. Dorless was a beast last year. He was a disruptor. He has been for the last three seasons for the for the Ducks as he's you know really reached his full potential. He was not a highly sought-after recruit, but he's become an NFL caliber defensive lineman. And he's been a developmental kid along his trajectory. I think he was a 2019 recruit. And guess what? He's going to be probably a second or third round pick in the NFL. That'd be my guess. I'll, I'll, I'll go third maybe. But I think he is fantastic. And he was absolutely helped by having Jordan Birch, someone else who commanded that level of attention. And I think, you know, DJ Johnson was solid last year, but I just don't think that he was – operating at the same level as Jordan Birch. I, I think Birch was more disruptive, more physically imposing, and commanded more attention. That frees up Dorless to get more 1v1s. So I think it's beneficial to have a guy like Nolan on the defensive line from an experience standpoint to help teach the young kids because Nolan has been in college football for a couple of years. But I also just think from you know that doorless birch dynamic standpoint, it's really, really good to not have one guy commanding all the attention. I, I think the young guys for Oregon's defensive line, I think they're going to pop next year. I don't know who. I don't know how many between Terrence Green, Amari Washington, Ashton Porter, uh, Johnny Bowens. Like Those guys all redshirted this year, and some of them are going to be playing next year. I don't know which ones. That'll be, that'll be something that I think is going to be really interesting to follow as spring football kind of rolls around because that depth chart – is going to look a lot different next year. It's going to be one of the most changed units up front for Oregon. And you have a lot of young guys, right? Blake Purchase, Tatum Tuioti, and Mateo Uyunglele, Amarion Winston as well. All four of those guys played regularly this year. That's going to be the case next year too. But on the interior, you don't know if Jordan Birch is coming back. And Nolan's a guy who, you know, like Birch, can play kind of inside and out. I think he'd play a good amount on the inside because that's where Oregon, I think, is looking for experience to supplement the youth and talent that they have. But I think it's good to have a veteran in the room in addition to young, talented players. But I also think you want someone who commands that sort of attention so that other guys are not facing as many double teams. Great question, though. Keep them coming. Got a lot of mailbag questions. And guess what? Like I told you during the season, 
We got about nine months of off season until Oregon takes field again. Although there is Fiesta Bowl. We, I will be watching and talking about the Fiesta Bowl plenty here on the show. But that first game against Hawaii is August 24th. It's a long ways away. So send all your questions. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, go Ducks.